are rocking and rolling. Alright, whenever? Whenever. Alright. Hello, I am here with Lou Wagner, a very talented uh, character actor who's had quite a long career. And uh, Lou, how are you today? Fine, fine. How are you doing? Not too bad. Yeah. Happy, pleasure to talk to you. Uh, now, first off, I wanted to ask you, uh, early in your career, you were actually signed uh, to be managed by uh, somebody who works with child actors. Uh, I, I uh, got a chance to read that on your website. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, you mean my first agent? Yes. Um, well, I had a friend in the business uh, who, who was uh, an executive at NBC. And when I first got to town, I, I said, you know, um, what, what, who should I go to? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really new at this. He said, well, you look so young. Uh, I, I really think you should go with the, with the children's agent, you know. So I first went with Mary Grady, who was Don Grady's mother, you know, of uh, my three sons. Oh, yeah. And, um, and then she had a, um, an adult division, and um, it was headed by Pat Amaral. So I was with Pat for years and years in, in the adult uh, division side of that. And I played, um, I played kids for, oh, seven, eight, nine years. So, so um, I just wanted to clarify, uh, for this agency, there was sort of an adult division where uh, like adult there was actors an adult would division, yeah uh but but she she got me a lot of um a lot of uh um kid parts you know like yeah. uh, the lost in space and you know, and, yes, and i did a, a lot of um dragnets i did i think six dragnets all playing kids you know excellent uh, now, you began uh, your career in theater, and uh, you uh, worked not just as an actor. I believe, actually, acting came a little bit later for you, but you uh, did a bunch of other jobs, such as uh, mailing programs and, uh, and selling tickets for, for the theater group you're working with. Uh, what do you feel like, uh, at this point, doing those jobs, obviously, besides being necessary for theater, uh, helped? How, how do you feel those jobs helped you as an actor later on? Well, the, the reason that I started doing that was that I went to uh, um, a gentleman who owned the Players Ring in town, and that was the best live theater in town at that time. Uh, it, it was Little Theater, and um, I said, "I will, I will work with you for um, seven days a week, ten hours a day, for nothing." I just wanted to be around the best actors in town. And of course he, he uh, promptly hired me. <laughs> and that's when I did all the, the other things that were needed around the theater, you know. And, and uh, to, in payment, he gave me the, um, the concession stand at intermission. So oh. <sighs> any money that I made was mine. And uh, it was very um, um, symbiotic relationship, you know. Huh? Now, um, you, you had uh, mentioned before, and uh, this is a, I'll be honest, this is a, a particular favorite role of mine, uh, was your role as uh, J5 in the Lost in Space episode, The Haunted Lighthouse. Um, oh, yeah. Are there any uh, fond memories of the set that uh, you'd like to share for us, or...? Well, I just I, I just remembered that um, everyone was really nice. It was a they were uh, whenever you're on a, a a set where the show is a hit, everyone is very happy. You know? <laughs> oh, and I'm sure that was a hit show, and um, and I had a, a great uh, great time with everybody. I, I remember um, um, Jonathan clock gave Tootsie Pops out to everybody. That was just a, a little happy thing, you know. And uh, um, and I also heard that um, that he saved 
the money from uh, from the show, and he had the the studio um, make a kind of different check for all his overtime. So his regular payment for the week he put away, and he lived on his overtime, which oh, is wow. very smart for an actor. Oh wow. But uh, you, you were saying it was a lot of fun, and honestly, you, you looked like you were having a lot of fun. And, and part part of it is the mischievous sort of end of the character, but uh, also yeah. you just also you just looked like you were having a lot of fun. So, um, yeah. Uh, and also, you had mentioned that you did a number of episodes, a number of episodes of uh, Dragnet. Now, there's a question I wanted to ask. Jack Webb has a reputation for being very serious you know his sort of public persona is very serious was he always that serious on set that you encountered yes um but there's a I'm, it reminds me of something um uh his um the feeling of that show you know everyone almost spoke the same way on the show yeah and, and the reason that that happened was um it's the only show that I've ever heard of that does it this way. Um, he, there would be the master shot where you saw where everyone was. And then when it, when it got to your, um, your close-up, you didn't look off camera to an actor. You looked off camera to a teleprompter. And he didn't want you to learn your lines he wanted you to read them. Oh. That gave a certain feeling to the show. Oh, okay. So if you notice, like, there was one show, um, uh, I forget the name of it, but it was the three of us kids. We were going off to um, um, start a different country. And, yeah, like, like a utopia type. Yeah. Oh, type of that thing. That yeah. show we did in one day because we all had so many speeches and all we had to do is after they they finished with the master shot then when i was talking to jack i would talk to one teleprompter and then when i talked to his partner i'd look over to the other side and talk to the other teleprompter and just oh, wow. i had to catch my place you know where, where i you know could could read the scroll and just went back and forth you know, with the different characters, and and um, we we were able to do the complete show in one day because of that. But because of that, you get a a feeling of the show yeah. that no other show had. You know, and um, it seems like Dragnet also has like a particular rhythm to the dialogue as well, and I feel like that probably uh, probably contributed to that a bit. So yes, yes. Now, uh, recently, I actually got a chance to uh, see uh, your movie Hello Down There, uh, the movie starring Tony Randall. And yeah. um, being, being a drummer myself, uh, I was actually quite impressed uh, because um, the kids in the group were miming along to the track. And you actually looked very competent as a drummer. And I, I was wondering if you got any training on set uh, in terms of, like, uh, drumming. Uh, have you played drums yourself or...? Well, um, I, I, I learned for the show. We had to audition for the music department at Paramount to get the job. So uh, about three or four weeks before, I borrowed a friend's drum set, and I practiced and practiced. And then when I got the part, um, I had records of the, of the songs that we were going to be doing. And I did nothing but practice and practice and practice, you know. So, um, you know, that, that really helped. <laughs> Definitely. And, uh, you know, like as I was saying, you know, was a lot of times when you have uh, actors uh, portraying a band, and also because I'm, because I'm a musician, it's a little bit, I'm a little bit picky about it. You know, it, it sort of seems... Like it's a little bit off sync, but I was actually really impressed, particularly with your drumming, because because obviously the practice showed it. it... Oh, good, good, <laughs> good. Well, they had a little problem with um, syncing the sound, and they worked and worked and worked on it. Um, 
and and fortunately it, it turned out okay but for some reason they were out of sync uh, a, a lot of time you know um uh, the the um and they were telling me about that about uh, uh, about three weeks after we finished, you know. But they said we we kept pulling pulling the frames and finally got it in there. You know? <laughs> but I I enjoyed it. I I, um, I played uh, Rick Dreyfus's younger brother, you know, and, uh, and and the group was great. You know, we we we've been friends ever since. All of us, you know. Excellent. Now, uh, for some of your roles, um, as in your uh, appearance uh, in the Planet of the Apes films, uh, as well as your appearance on Star Trek, you were heavily made up for a lot of them. And uh, some actors find that a little bit of a hindrance in terms of getting into the role. Some people actually find it easier to get into a role that way. Um, in your experience, how do you feel about that, about uh, using makeup? Well, um you're right. You know, after after uh, like um, Planet of the Apes, after say six hours in the chair, and you finally uh, see what you look like in the mirror, it's it's pretty easy to figure. Well, yeah, I am Lucius. You know, so it it, it does help an actor, and uh, the Ferengis that I played. Same thing, you know, you're in the chair for a long time, you're radically made up, and it, it, uh, it's very easy to suspend your disbelief. Yeah. Yeah, you really are that chair. Now, uh, your role in uh, Airport uh, was so iconic, and, and I have the name down here, I'm actually not quite sure how to pronounce the first name. <laughs> Skyler, Skyler Schultz. Skyler Schultz. Uh, that, that part was so iconic that it was actually parodied in uh, the classic comedy Airplane. Uh, did you see it? And if so, what was your reaction to that? Did, did I see what? Uh, the uh, comedy Airplane. Uh, closer. Uh, the comedy Airplane, that uh, parodied airport. It's one of my favorite shows. Uh, airplane is is super. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and the kid that they brought in the into the cockpit was you know my character. You know, uh, like a takeoff on my character. But um, I love the show. I I, I uh, um, remember many many lines you know from it. That and. Uh, Young Frankenstein are my, some of my favorite shows. That is a great one. Uh, now, in your biography on your website, uh, you pointed out that you use your height to your advantage. Now, uh, there, you only really uh, rarely play specifically short characters, and uh, other people of uh, short stature in the industry, uh, other very talented people, such as uh, Paul Williams and Davy Jones, found a lot of their opportunities limited because of this. Uh, to what do you attribute the difference in, in terms of not specifically having that limitation on your parts? Um, uh, luck. Because uh, I played a lot of jockeys, too, where of course you have to be small. My The, the first part I ever had on film was uh, a jockey in um, a, a short-lived um, series called the Gene Arthur Show, and and my scene was with Mickey Rooney, and um, so once I got started, um, I was playing kids and jockeys. So um, later on in life, I was lucky enough to come up with people that um, they could see farther than that. You know, like. Uh, like now, the show I'm doing now, Greg Garcia, um, I, I play a, um, an attorney for, um, you know, for his show. And, um, and, and uh, I, I, you know, most of my friends up until this point would say, what, you playing a, an attorney? Come on, you know. But uh, it worked out and um, I'm very happy about it. <laughs> Excellent. I was going to say, they, they must... Oh, I'm sorry? Everything is luck. You know, you, you, you either 
you know, um, have to struggle and struggle and struggle, or you, you're lucky enough to get a gig that, that, you know, like if if you're in a show for eight years and you're a young teenager, then you grow up on that show, and by yeah. the time you're a young adult, you've got all that, you know, all that behind you, and people that will then give you more of a chance, you know. Oh yeah, uh, certainly. It helped me in um, in chips. I was in chips for five years, so by the time I finished with that, people, you know, could see me as an adult, you know, and that was really about the end of of my playing kids. Because you grow and develop with the show, correct? Right, right. Now, uh, one thing that uh, a lot of audience members might not know is you are involved in a uh, comedy group, uh, Fred, Willier's, uh, Fred Willard's uh, Moho Sketch Comedy Group. Yes, now, this, I love it. Now, this is yeah. sort of uh, a super group like uh, Second City for, for comedy. Yeah, yeah. Who are in some fact, of the... We play uh, about once a month at Second City. Oh, wow. Uh, Fred's group, yeah. Now, uh, who are some of the other familiar faces that you work with uh, in the group? Uh, of where? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, who are some of the other uh, like familiar faces that we might have uh, heard of that are in the group as well? Um, oh, well, Richard Horvitz, uh, who, who does a lot of character work and uh, a lot of voiceovers and and um, um, uh, Bill Farmer, who is also. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bill Farmer is uh, the voice of Goofy for oh. um, all the Disney shows and stuff. But we have a great, uh, a great group of guys and gals. And and um, I, I met Fred when I was when I did a show um, called uh, Sodbusters. It was a takeoff on Shane. And um, and I really enjoyed his humor, and and uh, he invited me to one of his shows when we got back uh, in town, and I just loved it. And I said, "Oh, Fred, I I, I want to be a part of this, you know." And he let me, and uh, it's been about fifteen or sixteen years now that we've been doing it. Wow! Well, and we great. played we played in San Francisco. We you know, but but at least once a month we do a show at Second City. Excellent. Now, um, can you tell us a little bit? Uh, and and I actually tried to look this up a bit, uh, but uh, you did an episode of Funny uh, Funny or Die present a few episodes actually. Uh, oh yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your part in that. Yeah, uh, it, this was a short-lived series. Um, the the first year that Funny or Die. I went to HBO, and it was uh, it was written by uh, a, a good buddy of mine who's also in the Mohos, Tishon Shannon, and Tishon uh, was also a writer for um, uh, the Tonight Show, and then he moved on to uh, Saturday Night Live, and he was a writer for Saturday Night Live for years and years, and. Um, He's uh, one of the, the top sketch artists. I, I, I love his work. Uh, and, and, and what it was is uh, it, was, it was a show called um, um, Space Bait. And it starred Tishon's, uh, at that time, about three-year-old daughter. And she was going through space saving the universe. And I was mission control, in charge of uh, you know uh, her uh, journeys and and to protect her and you know, and it was it's tongue in cheek, but it's very funny. Interesting. Now now I'm gonna have to find it because I was uh, I was looking for it online. And I actually uh, had a bit of a tough time. <laughs> yeah, it's called Space Baby. Okay. So see if you can find it. Um. There's actually another question I'm afraid I uh, skipped over, but it was related to the uh, question about the mohos. Um, personally, I find that uh, performing for television and film are completely different. And um, 
when you work before a live, a live audience like you do with the mohos, uh, the energy tends to shape the performance to a degree. Uh, do you find that to be a case? Yeah, to be the yeah, case? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when, when you work in multiple levels, uh, stage, film, television, um, they're different gears. And it's, it's just something that you naturally slip into, you know. Stage is a real actor's medium uh, because once you're on that stage, uh, if the director's backstage and he told you to do something and he sees that you're not doing it, there's nothing he can do about it. True. We're on and we're going, you know. Yeah. So um, stage is the actor's medium. Um, whereas film is a director's medium. You know, the director shapes the, the whole project. Um, and television is more of a producer's medium where the director has a say-so, but the head honcho for the overall feel of the whole project is the producer. Um, but when I'm, when I'm doing stage something live, um there's an energy that comes back to you it's a it's a, a a give and take between the actor and the audience and